Consequentialism is the class of normative ethical theories holding that the consequences of one's conduct are the ultimate basis for any judgment about the rightness or wrongness of that conduct. Thus, from a consequentialist standpoint, a morally right act is one that will produce a good outcome or consequence. In an extreme form, the idea of consequentialism is commonly encapsulated in the English saying, the end justifies the means, meaning that if a goal is morally important enough, any method of achieving it is acceptable. Consequentialism is usually contrasted with deontological ethics, in that deontology, in which rules and moral duty are central, derives the rightness or wrongness of one's conduct from the character of the behavior itself rather than the outcomes of the conduct. It is also contrasted with virtue ethics, which focuses on the character of the agent rather than on the nature or consequences of the act itself and pragmatic ethics which treats morality like science, advancing socially over the course of many lifetimes, such that any moral criterion is subject to revision. Consequentialist theories differ in how they define moral goods. Some argue that consequentialist and deontological theories are not necessarily mutually exclusive. For example, M. Scanlon advances the idea that human rights, which are commonly considered a deontological concept, can only be justified with reference to the consequences of having those rights. Similarly, Robert Nozick argues for a theory that is mostly consequentialist but incorporates inviolable side constraints which restricts the sort of actions agents are permitted to do. Philosophies state consequentialism it is the business of the benevolent man to seek to promote what is beneficial to the world and to eliminate what is harmful, and to provide a model for the world. What benefits he will carry out, what does not benefit men he will leave alone. Motsi, Motsi Part 1 Mohist Consequentialism, also known as State Consequentialism, is an ethical theory which evaluates the moral worth of an action based on how much it contributes to the welfare of a state. According to the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, Mohist Consequentialism, dating back to the 5th century BCE, is the world's earliest form of consequentialism, a remarkably sophisticated version based on a plurality of intrinsic goods taken as constitutive of human welfare, unlike utilitarianism, which views utility as the sole moral good. The basic goods in Mohist consequentialist thinking are order, material wealth, and increase in population. During Mozi's era, war and famines were common, and population growth was seen as a moral necessity for a harmonious society. The material wealth of Mohist consequentialism refers to basic needs like shelter and clothing, and the order of Mohist consequentialism refers to Mozi's stance against warfare and violence, which he viewed as pointless and a threat to social stability. Stanford sinologist David Shepard Niverson, in the The Cambridge History of Ancient China, writes that the moral goods of Mohism are interrelated. More basic wealth, then more reproduction, more people, then more production and wealth. If people have plenty, they would be good, filial, kind, and so on. And problematically, the Mohists believe that morality is based on promoting the benefit of all under heaven and eliminating harm to all under heaven. In contrast to Jeremy Bentham's views, state consequentialism is not utilitarian because it is not hedonistic or individualistic. The importance of outcomes that are good for the community outweigh the importance of individual pleasure and pain. The term state consequentialism has also been applied to the political philosophy of the Confucian philosopher Zunzi. Utilitarianism nature has placed mankind under the governance of two sovereign masters, pain and pleasure. It is for them alone to point out what we ought to do, as well as to determine what we shall do. On the one hand the standard of right and wrong, on the other the chain of causes and effects are fastened to their throne. They governed us in all we do, in all we say, in all we think. Jeremy Bentham, The Principles of Morals and Legislation, CHIP1 In Summary, 
Jeremy Bentham states that people are driven by their interests and their fears, but their interests take precedence over their fears, and their interests are carried out in accordance with how people view the consequences that might be involved with their interests. Happiness, on this account, is defined as the maximization of pleasure and the minimization of pain. Historically, hedonistic utilitarianism is the paradigmatic example of a consequentialist moral theory. This form of utilitarianism holds that what matters is the aggregate happiness, the happiness of everyone and not the happiness of any particular person. John Stuart Mill, in his exposition of hedonistic utilitarianism, proposed a hierarchy of pleasures, meaning that the pursuit of certain kinds of pleasure is more highly valued than the pursuit of other pleasures. However, some contemporary utilitarians, such as Peter Singer, are concerned with maximizing the satisfaction of preferences, hence, preference utilitarianism. Other contemporary forms of utilitarianism mirror the forms of consequentialism outlined below. Ethical egoism Ethical egoism can be understood as a consequentialist theory according to which the consequences for the individual agent are taken to matter more than any other result. Thus, egoism will prescribe actions that may be beneficial, detrimental, or neutral to the welfare of others. Some, like Henry Sidgwick, argue that a certain degree of egoism promotes the general welfare of society for two reasons. Because individuals know how to please themselves best and because if everyone were an austere altruist then general welfare would inevitably decrease. Ethical altruism Ethical altruism can be seen as a consequentialist ethic which prescribes that an individual take actions that have the best consequences for everyone except for himself. This was advocated by August Comte, who coined the term altruism, and whose ethics can be summed up in the phrase, live for others. Rule consequentialism in general, consequentialist theories focus on actions. However, this need not be the case. Rule consequentialism is a theory that is sometimes seen as an attempt to reconcile the ontology and consequentialism, and in some cases, this is stated as a criticism of rule consequentialism. Like deontology, rule consequentialism holds that moral behavior involves following certain rules. However, rule consequentialism chooses rules based on the consequences that the selection of those rules have. Rule consequentialism exists in the forms of rule utilitarianism and rule egoism. Various theorists are split as to whether the rules are the only determinant of moral behavior or not. There are also differences as to how absolute these moral rules are. Thus, while Nozick's side constraints are absolute restrictions on behavior, Amartya Sen proposes a theory that recognizes the importance of certain rules, but these rules are not absolute. That is, they may be violated if strict adherence to the rule would lead to much more undesirable consequences. One of the most common objections to rule consequentialism is that it is incoherent because it is based on the consequentialist principle that what we should be concerned with is maximizing the good. But then it tells us not to act to maximize the good, but to follow rules. Brad Hooker avoided this objection by not basing his form of rule consequentialism on the ideal of maximizing the good. He writes, the best argument for rule consequentialism is not that it derives from an overarching commitment to maximize the good. The best argument for rule consequentialism is that it does a better job than its rivals of matching and tying together our moral convictions, as well as offering us help with our moral disagreements and uncertainties. Derek Parfit described Brad Hooker's book on rule consequentialism ideal, code, real world as the best statement and defense, so far, of one of the most important moral theories, two-level consequentialism. The two-level approach involves engaging in critical reasoning in 
considering all the possible ramifications of one's actions before making an ethical decision, but reverting to generally reliable moral rules when one is not in a position to stand back and examine the dilemma as a whole. In practice, this equates to adhering to rule consequentialism when one can only reason on an intuitive level, and to act consequentialism when in a position to stand back and reason on a more critical level. This position can be described as a reconciliation between act consequentialism, in which the morality of an action is determined by that action's effects, and rule consequentialism, in which moral behavior is derived from following rules that lead to positive outcomes. The two-level approach to consequentialism is most often associated with R. M. Hare and Peter Singer. Motive consequentialism Another consequentialist version is motive consequentialism which looks if the state of affairs that results from the motive to choose an action is better or at least as good as each of the alternative state of affairs that would have resulted from alternative actions. This version gives relevance to the motive of an act and links it to its consequences. An act can therefore not be wrong if the decision to act was based on a right motive. A possible inference is that one can not be blamed for mistaken judgments if the motivation was to do good. Negative consequentialism Most consequentialist theories focus on promoting some sort of good consequences. However, negative utilitarianism lays out a consequentialist theory that focuses solely on minimizing bad consequences. One major difference between these two approaches is the agent's responsibility. Positive consequentialism demands that we bring about good states of affairs, whereas negative consequentialism requires that we avoid bad ones. Stronger versions of negative consequentialism will require active intervention to prevent bad and ameliorate existing harm. In weaker versions, simple forbearance from acts tending to harm others is sufficient. Often, negative consequentialist theories assert that reducing suffering is more important than increasing pleasure. Karl Popper, for example, claimed, from the moral point of view, pain cannot be outweighed by pleasure. When considering a theory of justice, negative consequentialists may use a statewide or global reaching principle. The reduction of suffering is more valuable than increased pleasure. Teleological ethics Teleological ethics is an ethical theory that holds that the ends or consequences of an act determine whether an act is good or evil. Teleological theories are often discussed in opposition to deontological ethical theories, which hold that acts themselves are inherently good or evil, regardless of the consequences of acts. Teleological theories differ on the nature of the end that actions ought to promote. Eudemonist theories hold that the goal of ethics consists in some function or activity appropriate to man as a human being, and thus tend to emphasize the cultivation of virtue or excellence in the agent as the end of all action. These could be the classical virtues, courage, temperance, justice, and wisdom, that promoted the Greek ideal of man as the rational animal, or the theological virtues, faith, hope, and love, that distinguished the Christian ideal of man as a being created in the image of God. Utilitarian type theories hold that the end consists in an experience or feeling produced by the action. Hedonism, for example, teaches that this feeling is pleasure, either one's own, as in egoism, or everyone's, as in universalistic hedonism, or utilitarianism. With its formula of the greatest pleasure of the greatest number, other utilitarian type views include the claims that the end of action is survival and growth. As in evolutionary ethics, the experience of power, as in despotism, satisfaction and adjustment, as in pragmatism, and freedom, as in existentialism. The chief problem for eudaimonist theories is to show that leading a life of virtue will also be attended by happiness, by the winning of the goods, regarded as the chief end of action, that Job should suffer and Socrates and Jesus die while the wicked prosper, then seems unjust. Eudaimonists generally reply that the universe is moral and that, in Socrates' words, no evil can happen to a good man, either in life or after death, or, in Jesus' words, but he who endures to the end will be saved. 
Utilitarian theories, on the other hand, must answer the charge that ends do not justify the means. The problem arises in these theories because they tend to separate the achieved ends from the action by which these ends were produced. One implication of utilitarianism is that one's intention in performing an act may include all of its foreseen consequences. The goodness of the intention then reflects the balance of the good and evil of these consequences. With no limits imposed upon it by the nature of the act itself, even if it be, say, the breaking of a promise or the execution of an innocent man. Utilitarianism, in answering this charge, must show either that what is apparently immoral is not really so or that, if it really is so, then closer examination of the consequences will bring this fact to light. Ideal utilitarianism tries to meet the difficulty by advocating a plurality of ends and including among them the attainment of virtue itself, which, as John Stuart Mill affirmed, may be felt a good in itself, and desired as such with as great intensity as any other good, acts and omissions and the act and omissions doctrine, since pure consequentialism holds that an action is to be judged solely by its result. Most consequentialist theories hold that a deliberate action is no different from a deliberate decision not to act. This contrasts with the acts and omissions doctrine, which is upheld by some medical ethicists and some religions. It asserts there is a significant moral distinction between acts and deliberate non-actions which lead to the same outcome. This contrast is brought out in issues such as voluntary euthanasia. A pure consequentialist would see no moral difference between allowing a patient to die by, for example, withholding food, switching off their life support machine, or actively killing them with harmful drugs.